Hello everyone, this is Direwolf20, and welcome to episode 2 of Direwolf20's Actually Editions Mod Spotlight. Today we're going to be taking a look at a bunch of other stuff. So last episode in part 1 we saw the basics of how to use the mod. How to craft with the Atomic Reconstructor, how to craft with the Empower, how to get power from the Coal Generator, and how some of these cool laser systems worked. Today, we're going to be talking about a bunch of the blocks that are available in the game. So there's a lot to cover, and we're going to get started right now. So the book adds um, several chapters here and breaks things up into blocks that don't use RF and blocks that do. And then also blocks that generate RF. Let's do these kind of in an opposite order. Let's start with blocks that generate RF, because these are all pretty straightforward and easy to understand. So we're going to cover some of the basic power gen options, actually additions, adds, and we're going to do them start to finish with easy to hard. So one of the easiest ones available, solar panel. Not too hard to understand. It gets power from light. You can see it produces 8 RF attack when it has direct daylight above it. And it's daytime. Any blocks above it that are transparent, like glass, may decrease its efficiency. So 8 RF attack, no big deal. The next one is the heat collector. What this does is it generates RF using heat from adjacent blocks, specifically lava. It produces about 40 RF attack, um, and the four lava blocks need to exist around the different sides, but not on top. And it needs to have at least four blocks of lava before it'll start generating power. So if I place down one block here, we'll notice we're not getting any power. Nor with two. Not even with three. What we will get it with is our fourth. Now we should be producing 40 RF a tick. However, you should note that every now and then, the heat collector will consume that lava, and you'll have to replace it. So as you can see, a period of time has elapsed, and one of those lava source blocks is gone. Womp, womp, womp. We did generate a decent amount of RF from that, but we're going to have to replace this. So definitely factor in the need to automate this thing in order to keep the power flowing. The leaf eating generator does exactly what it says on the tin. It eats leaves. Uh, if we check on the book, we'll see that we get about 300 RF per leaf uh, that's broken in the process. Um, and by right-clicking the RF, you can see how much RF it has stored. It has a range of about seven blocks. So this thing has a pretty short range. It won't go too far, um, but it'll definitely break some leaves. So plant this thing next to a tree farm, and rather than getting saplings from your leaves, it might eat the leaves and generate a little bit of RF. Sweet. You can also see some cool particle effects as it breaks them. Fancy. The next one is the bioreactor, which those of you who've used the bioreactor in Mine Factory Reloaded should recognize some of the functionality here. Basically, it uses all types of seeds, food stuff, and plants to generate RF, as it says in the manual. Uh, just place the items in its UI. The one thing to note, though, is that you'll get more power if you use different kinds of plants in there at the same time. Cool. So let's get a few things. We'll get some seeds, and some pumpkin seeds, and we'll get some wheat, and we'll get some potatoes, and we'll get some carrots. How's that sound? Pretty cool. So let's throw seeds in there. Right now we're generating four RF a tick. We throw another set of seeds in there, and maybe some carrots and some wheat and some potatoes. The next time it runs its burn, it's gonna use all of them, and we'll get 64 RF a tick. So a variety definitely adds to this, right? So with four different types of items, we're getting 64 RF a tick. With two different types of items, we're getting 16. Not bad. That's actually really cool. Um, so things can get really crazy, obviously. Wheat, it doesn't look like wheat fits in there, but uh, you know, experiment. Different types of resources will fit in there. And again, the more variety you have, the more RF a tick, and the more efficient the bioreactor will be. The final generator that I wanna show you is the oil generator. And there's several tiers of oil that we can put in here to create some power. Pretty cool. Let's see how it works. So the first tier of power that you want to might get is canola seeds. You find these in the world from harvesting grass the same way you find regular seeds. And when they're grown, which we're going to skip, you get canola. Cool. Um, so the canola uh, that you get from here goes into a canola press. Excellent. You throw this in here, and it's going to require a little bit of power. So let's use a creative capacitor to help make that work. So once you've got your liquid canola oil, you can scoop it out with a bucket. And you'll notice it'll pick up 1,000 millibuckets or one bucket's worth and start pressing more. Uh, that can now go into your oil generator. Ta-da! And the oil will sit there and it'll produce 40 RF a tick. Not bad. And it'll burn through relatively quickly. However, you might want to get some more efficiency from it. So there's another tier of production you can do. The fermenting barrel. Cool. Throw a bucket of oil in there and it'll start fermenting. Now this is a pretty slow process, but it doesn't require RF. Not bad. Once you've gone and gotten your oil from the fermenting bucket, neat, you can go ahead and drop it into your oil generator, assuming that its current buffer of liquid is empty. Drop it in there, and you'll notice we're now getting 100 RF a tick. It burns at about the same speed, but we can go even further. 
you can produce a little bit more power if you take the oil that you have and drop in a crystallized canola seed. All you need to do is hit a canola seed with an atomic reconstructor. Costs 2000 RF in addition to the 1000 that the firing of the laser costs, so keep that in mind, but you get a crystallized canola seed. Cool, drop that in there and suddenly you've got crystallized oil. If we were to go ahead and place our crystallized oil in there, you'll notice we're now getting 200 RF a tick. Sweet. Still about the same burn speed though. If you wanna go for the absolute max tier, go ahead and get your crystallized oil and drop in an empowered canola seed. So that's going to require one crystallized seed and four regular power, uh, canola seeds over there in the empower that we saw earlier in part one. Let's see what happens. Ta-da, we suddenly have empowered oil. This will produce a whopping 350 RF a tick. The burn speed is still about the same, but you're definitely getting lots more RF and lots more RF a tick. So if you wanna start with the basic one and then ramp up your power needs as you go, there's lots of automation that's gonna be involved. You're gonna to have to pipe items and power into here, and then you're going to have to route the liquids over to here, get the liquids in the world, and drop items into it. Lots of fun for automation and definitely a good power system. Now let's talk about blocks that use RF, now that we've figured out how to generate some. The first one we're gonna take a look at, in order of the book, is the farmer. Seems pretty straightforward, it farms for you. It does so in a nine by nine block space in front of the farmer, so once you throw down some power, it's gonna start clearing out the farmland for you, which is really fancy and nice. Don't forget, you're probably gonna want some kind of water source here to keep things liquidized and uh, prevent farm space from having an issue. So let's throw water in the center, make that farm nice and happy, and now we've got a good setup going. Neat. Uh, the left side of the UI is for seeds, and the right side of the UI is for harvested resources. So for example, if we get some seeds and we throw them in there, they're gonna start planting. Neat. And if we get some bone meal, we should have no problem growing it and demonstrating the fact that it does exactly what you might expect, is it'll eventually cycle through the entire farm, get to the grown wheat, and harvest it for you. So at this point, we should be getting pretty close. It picked up the wheat and seeds. Pretty cool. Note, by the way, that the seeds that it picks up goes into the right UI, not the left. So if you want to put these seeds back into here, you're going to have to route that yourself. This one's just for fun. It's the fireworks box. Neat. By default, when it's receiving a redstone signal, it would deactivate. And it'll randomly shoot fireworks into the air. Haha, <laughs> how cool is that? So, pretty much, the tooltip on this fireworks box is pretty accurate. It says, uh, you know, vanilla fireworks are just too bloody annoying to craft, but too awesome not to use. So here's the solution. Um, also, if you want, you can right click this with a redstone torch, similar to some other blocks in the mod that toggle it into pulse mode. Now a redstone pulse will activate the fireworks. Cool. Next up, the vertical digger. Give it some power and it's gonna start clearing out a uh, nifty little area right around it. There it goes, sweet. Um, it's got some options inside here, so only mining ores versus mining everything. And you can also reset it to start at the top again. Cool. You can pipe items out of it, obviously, as you would expect. And you can also upgrade the radius. So if you were to go ahead, according to the book, and grab yourself uh, some um, upgrades called Phantom Boosters, it'll uh, you can place three or less above it. So basically, if you want to upgrade this, you get phantom boosters, and we'll be talking about uh, some of these other phantom blocks in a moment here. Uh, but phantom boosters, there it is. You place them on top, boom. And now it's going to have a larger radius. Awesome. And up to three can be placed there. So one, two, three, and the phantom booster increases the radius significantly. Nice, we can't even hear it breaking the blocks. That's how far away it is. Pretty nice mining system. Of course, once it's full, it'll probably stop mining. And you're gonna to wanna to filter these items out of here. And it does use uh, a decent amount of RF. It uses uh, 1500 RF uh, per block of mining. The coffee maker we're gonna skip because that's a more complex block with a lot of nuances. So we're gonna take a look at that later. For now, we're gonna talk about the crusher and the double crusher. Pretty straightforward block. There's not a lot to talk about here. Uh, the crusher allows you to crush blocks and it works pretty much like any other mod that doubles ores. So for example, if we got some iron ore and we threw it in there, it's gonna go ahead and crush things for you. Nice. Doubles your ore production. The double crusher, as you might expect, has two slots. Neat. And what you can do is throw a bunch of ore in there. And if you want, you can turn on auto split items. What this does is it'll automatically balance the two stacks that are in there. And every time, um, you know, one stack is low, it'll rebalance it for you. 
pretty spiffy. Nice. The UI of the powered furnace should look very much like the UI of the double crusher because it's a furnace that can smelt two things at a time. And just like the uh, crusher, you can split items and make sure that it balances. Do note that each uh, smelting operation here is gonna require 25 RF a tick. So if you're doing two at a time, you'll wind up using 50 RF. As opposed, if you're not split and you're only using one at a time, you're using 25 RF a tick. Cool. The next block to take a look at is the Lava Factory. This will go ahead and produce lava for you. Neat. Uh, the Lava Factory requires 150,000 RF per block, so it's pretty expensive. You also have to place uh, these things called casings all on the four sides here. Now it says when you mouse over it, the Lava Factory is complete and can produce lava, provided that it receives enough power to do so. Go ahead and give it some power, and it'll work on creating a lava source block for you. There it goes, lava source block created. You can pick it up and it'll start working on the next one. Neat. The next two blocks go hand in hand. They are the Energizer and the Enervator. Pretty similar blocks. One of them charges items that use RF. So for example, uh, the Energizer is gonna charge up any items that use RF. An example would be a single use battery, an item from actual editions. There's several tiers of battery, by the way. The top tier able to hold 16 million RF and the bottom tier able to hold one million. Simply place the uh, empty battery inside the Energizer and it'll start filling it up using the energy inside the Energizer's capacitor, getting fed from an adjacent capacitor or any other power system that you've got feeding it. Nice. The Enervator works in the reverse. It drains power out. So when we place the uh, single battery in here, it'll go ahead and drain power out into the Enervator and then the Enervator can place it wherever it wants. Neat. The repairer is a neat little block. It uses 5,000 RF a tick, super expensive. It also requires some empowered diamantine crystal blocks, which are basically uh, pretty expensive as well um, to get. So the repair is a very high end tier item. It requires a lot of power and a lot of resources to make. But what it can do is, as it says on the tin, repair your items. Uh, it doesn't use any resources. It uses pure power to repair the damage values on your items. So we go ahead and throw this in here and you'll notice that it's slowly repairing over time. I placed a fully charged 5 million RF capacitor. You can see we're using 5,000 RF a tick. To repair what little damage was on this diamond pickaxe thus far has already used a ton of power. Um, so let's see, I think it was like around 100 damage on the diamond pick and uh, it's almost done and we've already used several million RF. So really pretty expensive to repair, but not a bad option if you don't feel like using diamonds to repair your diamond pickaxe or any other things that need to be repaired. Fancy, right? The next nifty block is the player interface. This requires power and it has a range of about 32 blocks. And basically you can use it to pipe items in and out of a player's inventory. So for example, let's go ahead and get a hopper and place it here. Neat. And then we place our lava bucket in there. Cool. That's pretty fancy. Nice, right? So uh, that's how that works. You can also pipe items out of it. So if you wanted to, for example, place the hopper underneath here, it'll start draining items out of my inventory. Awesome. Combine this block with the filtering system that the laser relays have or with the advanced ESD that allows you to extract items from specific inventory slots or specific items, and you've got a really powerful system for filtering and extracting items from your inventory. Uh, the other thing to note with this is you can put those uh, boosters on top, three of them again, to increase the range you wish and um, you can also charge any RF storing items in here if you have um, it attached to an RF input cool so let's take a look at that if we had a battery in our inventory it should automatically refill the battery courtesy of the player interface nice this works for any item that accepts RF power and all that power is coming right out of here next up is the display stand which we already saw a little bit uh, when working with that system. The display stand has a couple features. First off, you can really just put anything in there and it doesn't require power and the item will just float there and display. Nice, fancy, it'll live forever, it's cool. But there's some other things we can do. For example, um, there's an item in this uh, block called, or in this mod called the leaf blower. You place that on the display stand and it will use the power in the display stand to push away any leaves or tall grass in the area. Nice. We'll take a look at this item in the item section later, but you probably have a good idea of what it does. 
Later on in the spotlight, we'll also be taking a look at some rings that have potion effects on them. And you can go ahead and place that on your bar and having it there will give that effect to a player nearby. There's advanced versions of the rings as well. The basic ring can only apply to one entity and it's a short radius. The advanced ring sitting on there will apply to all entities in a large radius. However, it does require a significant amount of power. Let's see what that is. This guy's currently using, yeah, 325 RF a tick. Pretty decent. The shock absorber will protect an area from explosions. So for example, we get ourselves a shock absorber, we get ourselves some TNT, and we light that off. The shock absorber protects in a five by five radius. Hooray! Doesn't protect the player, but it does protect the blocks. Neat. It uses a bit of RF for every block it protects, around 300. Finally, we have the long range breaker. This is similar to the breaker, which we haven't seen just yet. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you both. Um, so there's the long range breaker and the auto breaker. The auto breaker, which doesn't require RF, goes ahead and breaks any blocks. Neat. If we look inside the UI here, it tells us that um, we can do a couple things. Breaks blocks in front of it. It can be oriented in every direction. When right clicking with the redstone torch in hand, it'll toggle between redstone mode and responding to pulses. Pretty cool. Um, there's another version of it called the long range breaker. This one does require power. The long range breaker, provided that you give the thing some power, will break up to eight blocks in front of it. The blocks broken go inside the UI. So go ahead and pull them out right there. So the internal inventory of the block, will get them all. Neat. And again, right clicking with a redstone torch, will go ahead and allow you to configure it so that it goes between pulse mode and to be deactivated by redstone mode. What better time to segue into the section of the book that talks about blocks that don't use RF. The first one is breakers and placers. Hey, we already talked about the breaker. Guess what the placer does? You probably guessed already. The placer places blocks. Go ahead and place some blocks in there and it'll place them in the world for you. Same deal with the redstone mode. Cool. There's also a fluid placer. The fluid placer does exactly what you would think. Uh, it goes ahead and places fluids. So go ahead and have facing in the right direction, pipe some fluid in there, and it'll place it in front. Pretty straightforward. Same redstone logic. The automatic precision dropper. Works much like an oil dropper, but it'll drop items without needing a redstone signal. It also won't spit them all over the ground, but it'll drop them in a straight line direction where you're pointing at. Same deal with redstone mode. So let's take a look. So place items in UI and they drop into the world and they don't spill all over the place like a vanilla dropper does. Amazing. The next one I talk about are phantom faces and these are really cool. So let's go ahead and take a look. Anybody who remembers transvector interfaces will probably understand phantom faces. What happens is you can go ahead and integrate two inventories. So for example, let's get ourselves a chest. Doesn't matter what kind of chest, we'll go with a gold one, okay? Place that in the world. Then place your phantom face nearby. Ta-da! Get yourself a phantom face connector. Ta-da! And go ahead and right click on the chest and then right click on the phantom face. Cool. You can see with a mouse uh, hover over, the connected block is the gold chest at this position and it's three blocks away. The connection is fine and working. You'll notice that according to the book, it tells you that it has a default range of 16 blocks, but you can throw phantom boosters on there if you want to make them further. Now, this um, item input in the phantom face will represent this chest. So for example, if we were to get ourselves a hopper, the phantom face will place its items inside the chest. Very much like a transfector interface, which you guys have probably seen from uh, the Thomcraft add-on mod. So that's pretty cool. You can, of course, if you want, still pipe items in directly. So this is a short range block. It's not meant to be like a Tesseract and it's not meant to be like a long range thing, but you can see it's pretty neat. If the block is broken, you'll notice that there's a connection problem. The connection is obstructed. It is either not in range, not loaded in chunks, or not the right type of block for this phantom interface. It's air, so yeah, it's bad. So we'll break that phantom interface and we'll talk about the next phantom face. And this one is called the phantom liquid face. Guess what it does? It pretty much works like a phantom face, but for liquids. So if we got ourselves a tank and we linked them together with the phantom connector, ta-da, we suddenly have a connection. And now we can pipe liquids into this block and they'll wind up inside this block. Sweet. So a demonstration we've shown here, if we dump liquid into the inventory below it and make sure the redstone signal's not on, 
it's going to go ahead and provided this thing's allowing water in. Go ahead and pour that in, and it goes right in there. Nice. Phantom energy face. Guess what this does? You probably guessed accurately. Uh, if we have a crusher and we want to give it power, we simply connect the two. And provided that there was any RF in here, it would probably work. Ta-da! Finally, there's the phantom redstone face. Guess what that does? You probably can, so I'm going to skip it. Next up, phantom breakers and placers. Default range of only three blocks. Keep that in mind. We'll do the breaker first. Simply link these guys. And he should wind up breaking any blocks in that block space. And placing them in the internal inventory. Sweet. I like it. If we were to go ahead and use the placer, it should do the same thing. Uh, simply place a block in the area and link it. And now it'll place them in that block once they have something in their inventory. Cool. You can specify placement sides, up, down, etc. Pretty cool, right? We've already seen ESDs and item distributors, so we're going to go ahead and skip it and head on over to the experience solidifier. Cool. The experience solidifier uses the player's experience and turns it into solidified experience, which can later be used by right clicking. Cool. Let's give it a shot. So we'll place down our experience solidifier and I can go ahead and get 10 experience levels. Nice. Notice that it took it from my current player base, right? So 10, if I wanted 64, not a problem. Awesome. And if I want to get all, I could just get all. There's none left in my inventory. If you want to get your experience back, simply right click or shift right click to do the entire stack. Awesome. I like it. These are stored as items. Um, and then you can also put some solidified experience in here. And if there's any experience on the ground, so for example, from a bottle of enchanting, or more likely from killing mobs, It'll pick up those experiences and uh, put them into solidified experience. Pretty cool. Sucks it up and creates it. So you can uh, use this to collect experience that's on the ground and then pipe these items into some kind of item storage system. And then when you want to go ahead and get it, shift right click to fill up your experience bar. Greenhouse glass speeds up the growth of plants. You're going to need an empowered palest crystal block, which I'm pretty sure is a little expensive, but you'll get the gist of it. Um, Greenhouse glass speeds up the growth of plants. Pretty cool. All it needs to do is be sitting above the plant somewhere. And as long as there's no blocks in between the greenhouse glass and the plant that's being grown, it should speed up the growth of it. Let's try it out. So all you really need to do is place that there and it should speed up the plant growth of the wheat. Neat. And you can see little green particle effects indicating that it's working. It'll only work for the block directly beneath the greenhouse glass. It'll only speed that up. You're going to need more greenhouse glass if you want to speed up other blocks. Do note, of course, that this only works during the daytime. I thought that was obvious. <laughs> fishing nets are for people like me who don't like fishing all that much. It's pretty easy. Just place it above a bit of water and place a chest on top. And eventually it'll harvest uh, stuff out of the water and drop it into the chest for you. The feeder is a block that's easy to understand from people who have seen similar items. Uh, basically it feeds nearby animals. So if there's a couple cows in the nearby vicinity and you've got some wheat in there, it'll go ahead and feed the cows the wheat. Should be pretty straightforward. Neat. You can see a little progress there and uh, it uses the wheat to feed the cow. And then the cows will do the cow thing. Hooray! Um, it should be noted that it'll automatically turn itself off if there are too many animals nearby, so it won't lag out servers. The composter makes compost. Simply get some biomash. It's a knife, which is a knife handle and a knife blade, not too hard to make, and some biomash. Biomash is pretty much any four food items with a knife. So you can see lots of different options. Okay, um, place that in here 10 at a time and eventually it'll convert down into fertilizer hooray fertilizer works like bone meal so you can go apply it to your crops and they'll grow storage crates are pretty cool they can hold a large number of items um you'll notice that the recipe here shows that it's going to require about four chests so it's basically like a compacted uh chest yeah it can hold a bunch of items it's pretty neat cool there's also a medium storage crate Hooray! It's got 
two pages. Notice that I can put items in here and flip between the pages. Guess what? The large storage crate does. Pretty much the same thing, except it's got three pages. Awesome. Lots of inventory space for you guys to play with. Um, if you want, you can go ahead and upgrade these along the line. So all you need, you can start with a chest and go ahead and shift right click on it with the storage crate, chest to storage crate upgrade, this one. Cool, and then it'll upgrade it to a storage chest. And if you want, you can upgrade small to medium and medium to large. And these will keep the inventories as you upgrade them along. You can also get the storage crate keeper. What this does is if you have items in there, when you install the storage crate keeper on the uh, large storage crate, what you do by placing the item inside the crate, when you break it, it'll keep its items. And when you place it again, you'll find the keeper is gone. So you have to recraft that keeper every time you want to do that. The ranged collector is pretty much like a vacuum chest. It's got a filter with a whitelist, blacklist, respecting metadata, ignoring MBT, and or dictionary settings, and pretty much any items that drop on the ground in a six foot radius will be sucked up by the ranged collector. If we make it an empty blacklist, it'll pick up all the items. Nice. Poof. And it gets sucked in there. Pretty cool. And we already covered the collector in uh, the previous spotlight, but basically it's used to filter more things than the default inventory allows. So we can place filters in here, like cobblestone, and make sure that it's part of the whitelist on here. And now only cobblestone will be allowed to be picked up, but no other items. Awesome. If we remove the filter and make it an empty blacklist, all items will be allowed to be picked up. And to me, guys, that feels like a good wrapping up point for Mod Spotlight Part 2. Next episode, we'll cover the last things in the mod, which will be items that don't use RF and items that do. And then there's some miscellaneous stuff in there that's pretty cool as well. For now, Darwell 20 signing off. Hope you guys enjoyed the actually additions Part 2 Mod Spotlight. Uh, lots of cool stuff in this mod, as you can tell. A pretty cool tech mod with a lot of nifty gadgets and stuff. All right, guys, take it easy.